All right, guys, here we are once again. And if you will notice, the screen is different because once again, a certain computer program crashed and we're having to use our backup system before we even be start uh, get started. So with that said, where did we leave off? <clears throat> we left off with our discussion uh, in regard to uh, ethics with another system that seems to have a few problems uh, in trying to ground, right? That's our, this, remember, we're trying, the grounding thing is our meta-ethical concern. <clears throat> but we, we left off with a uh, system of ethics called uh, a deontological system of et ethics, which was Kant's. And though it did have a lot of appeal, remember, you remember a great uh, acquiescence to rationality, uh, uh, to, 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 to the logical structure of an ethical system, to reason. It gave great respect to such things. Uh, but again, it did seem to have substantial problems, a uh, few substantial problems. Um, and one of those, again, is just our meta-ethical concern, right, which we're kind of going to kind of look at every time that we go through these uh, different theories is uh, meta-ethical concerns as well, even though, strictly speaking, we're uh, just going over ethics uh, proper, proper, you know, the, what, what, what can account for the right and wrong behavior, right and wrong acts, that sort of thing. So having said that, we're going to go ahead and go to our, uh, our newest uh, topic, which will be divine command theory. Now this will be, this is probably something that there are so many of you uh, that are familiar with, um, because roughly it's just, hey, look, uh, it's a fancy name for uh, God it's who tells us what's right and wrong, right? So let's go ahead and look at one of the over, an overview of this. Divine command theory is a deontological theory. Now, before we go any further, remember, utilitarianism, a consequentialist type ethical theory, Remember, it's concerned with what happens on down the road, right? So you do this, this, and this, what happens on down the road, that's what determines whether something is right or wrong. Remember, the deontological theory is not so much concerned with what happens down the road, it's the principle before you, right? The duty before you. And that's what makes something right or wrong. It's intrinsically right or wrong in and of itself, uh, apart from the consequences that are down the road. Remember, it may be said, you may hear, hear it said something like, uh, you do the right thing to heck with the consequences, right? Or maybe in a, a religious context, you do the right thing, you let God handle the consequences, something like that. Now, divine command theory is a deontological type ethic, because remember, it's about the command, it's about what God says, right? Uh, the principle before you. Now, let's continue to go on. Divine command theory is a deontological theory that usually piggybacks or dovetails on another system of ethics, um, Kantian deontology, natural law, etc., with additional emphasis on God's willing of revelatory commands. However, it is also sometimes treated as a meta-ethical theory. All right, so let's unpack that. Um, when we say that it's a deontological theory that usually piggybacks or dovetails on another system of ethics, what that means to say is it's being used in that sense to, to, to solve this meta-ethical concern, right? To be used as a grounding uh, source, so to speak, for whatever ethical theory you, you try to choose. Now, some, though, would try to consider divine command theory as just a theory, an ethical theory, all by itself. What, what is right and what is wrong is strictly told, right, uh, by God's commands, right, whatever God commands uh, that someone do. Um, and that's what we're going to look at initially is, all right, well, what, what, are, what are the appeals, what are the positives, what are the negatives if our system of ethics is just strictly what, what God says to do, right? Let's look at some of that. Now, some of the appeals. It would seem to give true and objective rights and wrongs, right? Because this would, at least in some sense, seem to solve the grounding problem. 
because it wouldn't now it wouldn't be that the issue before us is well who says that you know fill in the blank is wrong or who says that fill in the blank is right well if god does exist then by definition god would be the ultimate or, or highest authority right at least thus far in the conversation and so you'd say well i don't say you know my legislator doesn't say god says right this this comes from god he just is the ultimate in authority right the ultimate uh as far as uh there's just no other right above him now the second appeal might be something like this and this seems pretty obvious right it's extremely attractive to religious observers right and when we say that this this particular ethical theory is attractive to religious observers it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be just one religion meaning that um uh those that practice islam would have some form of divine command theory or could have some form of divine uh, command theory. Uh, obviously, uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, construct could have some sort of divine command theory. Um, practitioners of those two faiths could have uh, a divine command theory at work or in play in regard to their own ethical uh, uh, construct. So, if you're religious, right, if you're a practicing Christian, it just seems to make sense to say that, well, yeah, what's right and wrong is determined by or told by God, is commanded by God. Now, your third appeal would be something like this. We have a common intuition, right, that laws, <laughs> again, this is just so self-explanatory, but it's one of those things that people miss it's kind of like, you know, you miss the forest for the trees kind of thing. It's just right in front of you. And so it's so obvious that sometimes we forget it, but it's also a very strong uh, intuition. It's a very strong point uh, that needs to have to be considered. And it's just, again, as, we are, as, as we've just stated, that this seems to align with the common intuition that laws have law givers. So if you really feel as if you ought to do something, right? <clears throat> Say you have some moral obligation, right? Say you go into your house and there's a sign on the door that says, hey, clean up your room. Well, you feel like, well, if I ought to do that, then there's some person, right? There's somebody, there's some person, there's some, I'll say it this way, there's a personal agent behind that command to clean my room, right? And the fact that there is some sort of personal agent behind that command that's actually giving that command, that's actually telling me to do that, is what makes this command make sense, so to speak. Now, for instance, in contrast, suppose that you were to walk in the room or whatever, uh, same scenario, you're about to go in, you know, to your room, and on the door, there is so a sign that says, clean your room, all right? But now suppose that, and again, we're going to have to use our imaginations here pretty, we're going to have to, strongly is the word here, but let's just do it for the sake of argument. Let's say that some, you know, your, your little brother, your little sister is knocked on the fan, uh, and it's, and uh, you know they were they were learning their alpha you know their alphabet that day and there's letters all over the desk here and when the fan was turned on it all of a sudden scattered all the letters all through the air and they just landed on the door and it just happened of course ridiculous as it is but it just happened to when they splattered on the on the door there the the letters let's say somehow they you know they had sticky adhesive to them whatever and they paced themselves. Uh, just haphazardly in the sentence that says clean your room, right? Now, if you learned, if you became aware that no one had actually said clean your room, your mom wasn't concerned with that, right? Um, your dad, whoever, nobody had actually told you to clean your room, but it just happened to say that right across the door there. Um, then all of a sudden that command or that what you would think to have been a law 
something that you ought to do, it, it loses its weight, right? It, the, the, the wind is taken from the sails of that. There's no authority really there. There's no, there's no reason that you ought to obey that. After all, no one's told, no one told you to do it, right? It just happened to blow up and say that on the door uh, because of the wind and the fan there. There's no, there's no uh, personal agent behind that command. Does that make sense? Um, if you need to, just pause and think about that. No one has told you to do anything, right? You thought that you had an obligation to clean your room, but now that you know better, now that you know that there was nothing that issued, there was no person, there's no personal agent that issued that command, because you could st you could still say it was issued. You could say the wind and and, the, and and just by chance it blew across the door or whatever. Um, but there was no personal agent, and so because there was no personal agent, there's no person behind that. You don't really feel obligated to obey uh, the wind and the fan, right? Because of course they had no intention. There's no intentionality. A uh, fancy philosophical word we would use there. There's no intentionality behind the command to clean your room. No personal agency there at all. It was just chance. Now you could say, well, yeah, it was just chance, but I still should obey the uh, the law written across the door. Well, that seems <laughs> that's a that's a pretty tough argument to uh, to try to pull out. That okay, well, yes, it was just chance that they were written across the door, and I still have some sort of obligation to obey uh, chance, right? Because, again, if it was chance, it just as easily could have said, don't clean your room, right? Well, what does that mean? Why would you obey that as opposed to uh, obeying the other? It seems arbitrary. Now, that's one of the strongest, probably, one of the appeals that uh, this divine command theory plays into is that it's just there's a strong notion of, wait a minute. If I ought to do something, if I ought not to steal or I ought not to, you know, litter or whatever, then there's some personal, real personal agent that just didn't make that up, but that comes from some actual authority. And there's an authority that can back that if I don't obey that rule, right? This would be something like judgment, something like that. All right, so let's go to some of our objections. Now, this first objection is offered, is usually offered as the knockdown, uh, end all be all killer in the discussion of divine command theory. Now, two odd things about this. This particular response has been answered. But there are many philosophers that know that, and there seem to be many philosophers, both professional philosophers, that don't realize that this has been answered. So, before we go into that, let's look at this particular objection. Now, this objection, this is the first objection, and it's called the Euthyphro Dilemma. Now, if you're familiar with the Euthyphro Dilemma, you know immediately where this particular objection is going. If you don't, let's go over it, right? <clears throat> so, Euthyphro. First, what, in, what on earth is Euthyphro? Well, Euthyphro was a person in one of the dialogues of Socrates. Now, this comes to us via Plato, right? Uh, one of the philosophical disciples of Socrates was Plato. And so, Plato records that there's this conversation between Socrates and this individual named Euthyphro. Now, they're discussing, among other things, justice. Uh, someone's going to trial. I think it's Euthyphro's father in this, in this uh, example. And they're discussing these things. And the issue, this ethical consideration comes up, well, and really this is a meta-ethical consideration, is what makes something right or wrong, right? So they go through some various things or whatever. And now the objection comes up as to why or the difficulty, the dilemma 
as to why it couldn't be God, right, that does this. So the, ethical, uh, so the Euthyphro dilemma is posed like this. Socrates asks Euthyphro, he says, well, is that which is good, is it good, you know, whatever it is you do, you know, imagine something we would normally uh, perceive to be good. Is that, whatever it is, whatever the action is, whatever the behavior is, is that good because the gods, right, they're in ancient Greece, so he's using that, but we'll just, we'll just use the term God. Is the good, is it good because God says it's good? Or is it good because God recognizes it as good and agrees that that's good? All right, let that sink in for a minute. Is the right behavior or action or thought or whatever, is the good, is it good because God says it's good? Because God says that's good. Or is it good because God recognizes it as good? Now, whatever option you've chosen there, the Euthyphro dilemma is going to say that there's a terrible, terrible problem with either one of those options for someone that believes in God. If you choose this, you've got a very unsavory result. And if you choose this, then you've got a very unsavory result as well. And by unsavory result, we mean that you've got a serious problem on your hands if you want to try to say that divine command theory is a valuable ethical theory. Meaning that if, the, any, if this works, then one of these two problems will basically destroy your ethical theory. So what are those problems? In the dialogue, the first option, well, God, whatever is good, is good because God says it's good. The problem is, well, wait a minute. If something, if something is good because God says it's good, well, then that makes it completely arbitrary, so the objection goes. What do you mean arbitrary? Meaning it just is... If, if something is good because God says it's good, well, then God could just as easily have said something else. The opposite of that is good, right? The opposite is good. So if, if murder is wrong because God says it's wrong, and that's what makes it wrong just because God says, well, then now we really don't even know what, what it even means to say something is right or wrong, good or evil, because why, why? Well, because if Murder is wrong because God just says it's wrong. Well, then now God can just say that murder is right, and murder would be right. So think of it this way. How does that make it arbitrary? Well, apparently it makes it arbitrary because just as we drive on the right side of the road, right, in other nations they may drive on the left side of the road, right? Well, we see that there's really nothing moral or immoral, nothing really right or wrong, about choosing one over the other. It just as easily could have been the case that we decide to drive on the left side of the road as opposed to the right. But history, for whatever reason, we determined that we would ride on or drive on the right side as opposed to the left side. But it just as easily could have been the other way around and it wouldn't be any... It's only, quote-unquote, right because we chose to do it that way. But we just as easily could have chose to drive on the left side instead and that would have been right. Now, we don't usually think that rape of children, murder, <clears throat> uh, genocide, uh, all these sorts of things that we see as wrong, we don't think, we don't, we don't believe those to be just merely arbitrary, meaning that, well, you know, that is wrong, but it just happens to be wrong because God said it's wrong. And if he wanted, he could have even said, you know, it was right, and then that would be right. You see, the problem with that is it looks like it makes morality completely arbitrary. Um, just nothing, right? I mean, it's something we could have easily, God could have just as easily, with a wave of his hand, made it the other way. 
Now, say so you say, oh, okay, look, we'll just reject that. We'll go over here and say that God is, uh, or something is good or bad, and God says it's good or bad because God recognizes it as good or, as, as good or bad, right or wrong. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that aspect, right, and this would be the other horn of the dilemma. A dilemma is a logical argument, usually in the form of a, a, a disjunctive uh, syllogism combined with a, a, a hypothetical or a modus ponens, modus tollens type syllogism. So that basically you're only, you're supposed to be left, you start up here with these options and you narrow down to uh, it's either this or that. And either one of these is either results in absurdity or contradiction. And so it can't possibly be good. Right. So the other one of that dilemma is, well, then God, he just recognizes that murder is wrong and he agrees with, with that moral principle that murder is wrong. And so some may say, well, yeah, that, that's it. It's not just arbitrary. It really is wrong. And so God sees that is wrong, and he agrees that that's wrong. He agrees with that moral principle. Now, what's the problem with that for the theist? Now, in the ancient objection, right, when, when they're talking about the gods, right, well, the problem was, well, then what do we need the gods for, really, to determine? We don't really need the gods to determine right or wrong, because if that's the case, if it's the case that they see and recognize moral, you know, moral rights and moral wrongs, and they recognize those things as right or wrong, then that means that the more that that those that they're, they're they're right or wrong independent of the gods, and if they're independent of the gods, well, we don't really need the gods to figure out what's right and wrong. Now. You see the problem for the theist, because the theist, say the Christian or the Jew or the, the, the Muslim there, they believe, right, that ultimately, that God just is the ultimate. There is no standard of morality. There's no standard or anything over and above God. God just is the end all be all, ultimate, omniscient, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent, all of those things, right? But if God is just simply recognizing the right or the wrong, well, then God is not the standard, right? And so the same objection would seem like it still holds sway, meaning that, well, if God's not the standard, if even he's recognizing the right or the wrong, well, then maybe we don't even need God to figure out right and wrong, so to speak, or it doesn't, we don't need God to even ground morality because he's just recognizing it as the right or wrong. Now, again, now you see why these two options are supposed to be unsavory for the theist. On the one hand, if God just says whatever is right or wrong, then it makes morality look completely arbitrary, just as easily could, could be one way or the other. On the other hand, it seems to make God, reduce God's um, status, so to speak, to use that loosely, as the ultimate standard, as the ultimate end-all, be-all, because now there's some standard over and above him that he's merely uh, recognizing or subservient to, in some sense, this moral standard. Now, before we get into the typical... Uh, Christian uh, response to that. Let's look at this 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 uh, aspect that uh, Islam is, is. There's a large portion of Islam that adopts this view called voluntarism. Um, now, what they say is, all right, you know this whole first thing over here about, um, you know, if it, if if God commands it, that makes it right or wrong, and if God commands the other, then that makes that right or wrong. They just bite the bullet and say. Okay, yeah, that's it. Sorry, sorry if you don't like that. That just is what makes it right or wrong. Now, Christians generally reject that answer, um, historically speaking. And so what they do is there's a couple different ways that you would avoid a dilemma, right? Um, or to, to get out of a dilemma, a logical, the logical argument of a dilemma. You can either <clears throat> deny the truthfulness of, well, if this happens, then this happens, 
which is one horn of the dilemma. You can deny that either this happens or this happens, which is another, if this happens and this happens, this is the other horn of the dilemma. Or you can just split the, what's called split the horns of the dilemma and say there's a third option, meaning that the original dilemma, if this side is true, well, it would contradict this side. And if this side is true, it would contradict this side. So either option, you, you've got this contradictory thing going on, and it's just a big mess, and you can't get out of it. However, if you've got option A and option B, you could have option C. Because really, a dilemma is supposed to either give you option A or option not A, right? That's a real contradiction there. So to get out of the dilemma, if you've got just a logically possible third alternative in the middle here, say option C, well then you can reject, you can reject uh, the euthyphro dilemma if there's a logically possible third alternative. Now, it just so happens that there are logically possible third alternatives. And this is what we what we were discussing a moment ago about. Um, it being odd that there are many philosophers that this has been answered for a long time, and they know this, but there are many philosophers even still to this day that don't seem to be to realize that there's just a, another option. Um, now, the, the 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 cool thing, if you want to say it that way, about uh, these 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 solutions to dilemmas as a as a logical argument is that your third option doesn't even have to be known to be true. Well, what do you mean by that? How can it get out of the dilemma if it's not even true? Well, we didn't say that it's not true. The issue is it doesn't have to be known to be true, <clears throat> meaning it just has to be logically possible in order to get out of a logical dilemma, right? Because <clears throat> if this argument is set up as a logical argument, then in order for it to work, it has to be both valid and sound, right? And there can't be any other option as it pertains to a dilemma. Now, again, with a dilemma, there just has to be a logically possible third option. So what is that third option? Now, <clears throat> before we go down, let's go ahead and go into this third option. The third option is this. The first option is this. Remember, it just it doesn't even have to be true. It just has to be possibly, logically possible. The third option generally is this. I'll give the most popular first. Is that God, and if you've already taken a course on <clears throat> omnipotence and what omnipotence entails, omnipotence meaning that God can do anything you want, right? If you've already taken a course in that, odds are you've had a uh, 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 odds are you, you have taken a, a course in that, is that omnipotence doesn't mean that God can do just whatever he wants in the sense that he can do what is logically impossible. Not because God would lack power, but because the logically impossible is nonsense. You can't do nonsense, right? Well, why can't you do nonsense? Because there's nothing there to do. It's just there's nothing there, right? It's not that there's something that could potentially be done and God can't do it. It's that there's nothing there to do. It's just, it's just silliness, right? Now, in regards to this third option, God, according to the accepted, uh, accepted uh, uh, rule of, of omnipotence among sophisticated philosophers, both atheistic and theistic, that God can't do the logically impossible. So, what makes what makes God's commands not arbitrary? It's this. What makes God's commands not arbitrary? Meaning he can't just willy-nilly, ah, this is right today, this will be wrong tomorrow. You know, is that God always commands in accord. Get this, here, here, here's how they, they get out of this dilemma, is that God always accords his command with his own nature. Wait a minute, what do you mean by that? All right, so remember, on this hand, you had this ultimate standard, right? You had, you had this ultimate standard of right and wrong, right? That made it not arbitrary. There's this unchanging standard. Things are right, things are wrong, and God is, quote, unquote, just agreeing with that, right? Well, that standard 
according to the theist, according to the many Christian theists, is that that standard just is God himself, God's unchanging, unalterable, immutable nature. And God's commands, when God wills something, when God commands something, <clears throat> it will always be in accord with his own nature because he cannot contradict his own nature. He cannot contradict who he, quote unquote, is in his full essence, right? His being. He can't contradict that. He can't will against himself. Now, it's important to remember that, again, he can't do it because it's logically impossible. Omnipotence doesn't entail doing the logically impossible. It just means doing all that is possible God can do. So God can't will against his own unchanging, unchanging, immutable, transcendent standard, which is he himself. He wills in accord with his nature. Um, in fact, Christian theists will often point to their own scriptures to prove that God just can't do whatever. Well, one particular example of that is in Hebrews where it says uh, that God cannot, it is impossible for God to lie. Not just that God could lie, but he doesn't, but that it's impossible for God to lie. Why? Well, because something like if God, by his very nature, just is truth, right? Well, then God can't contradict his nature. The weakness, in fact, omnipotence, they would argue omnipotence would be, the weakness would be that if God could lie, that's a, that's a weakness and that's not a strength, right? So they would say something like, if you say, well, I can do something God can, I can lie. Well, that's not a, that's not supposed to be a bragging point. That's supposed, you're basically pointing out the flaw that you're weak, uh, where he's not. It's kind of like, you know, they, they would say something like, it's kind of like the guy going into the gym, uh, who, you know, never bothers doing anything in regards to exercise or working out. And he goes into the gym and he says, he looks at the guy who's, you know, busted his tail and put in the hours or whatever. And he looks at the guy that can bench 225, you know, 10 times. And he says, ha ha, I'm stronger than you. And the, the, the athlete says, well, wait a minute, how, how are you stronger than me? And he says, cause I can do something you can't do. In this gym right now, I can do something you can't do. And the guy says, well, okay, what is that? And he says, I can fail to bench press 225, 10 times. In fact, you know what? I can't even do it one time. And the gym guy says, so that, may, that means that you're stronger than me because you can do something that I can't? And then the guy says, absolutely, and triumphantly walks out the door. Well, everyone would see that's not his strength. <laughs> that's the guy's weakness, right? You can't say, well, I can do something you can't do, and that's fail. Well, failing is not a perfection, right? That's a weakness in the, th in the uh, thing itself. So lying or God contradicting his nature, something like that would be not be a strength, right? It would be a weakness. Anyway, you can go much deeper in that if you want to. That's aside, that's aside from the main point. The point is just saying that there's a logically possible third alternative, and is that God always commands Right, he is commanding, right? That's what makes something right or wrong, but that he always commands in accord with his perfect nature, his unchanging nature. Now, you also have another response, and this, this one just has to be logically possible. It doesn't even have to be true. But you could get, look at something like more of a classical type argument that would say something like God always commands in perfect accord with reason, right? So you, you kind of see a hint of how this might be slightly, not, re, not, not in a, a large or significant sense, but slightly related to uh, Kantian deontology in the sense that, you know, it has this high regard for reason. Um, but this, this, this one would say that God, being perfect in reason, can't contradict reason because he just is perfect in reason and always his will is always in perfect accord with perfect reason, right? Something like that. Again, was that true? It doesn't matter. It just has to be logically possible. And if that's logically pl possible, then the euthyphro dilemma can't get off the ground, um, meaning that it, you can't use the euthyphro dilemma to try to shoot down divine theory, um, divine command theory. One, this is an ethical theory, but you can't shoot it down uh, as a meta-ethical theory 
which I believe is more interesting, is the meta-ethical uh, concern, the grounding there, how it tries to uh, come across, how it can piggyback, so to speak, as a grounding on another, serve as the grounding for another ethical theory. Let's move on. What's your second objection? Now, read this first. Go ahead and read this before I read it out loud. I want you to try to kind of think of this for a second. Is there something that you're picking up on there? All right, let's read that and go through it. If divine command theory is taken as its own ethical system, then it may seem to be something like, something like a, you know, a, a bit superfluous, right? People generally knew right from wrong prior to special revelation. Now, what is special revelation? Special revelation in, in Christian theology and philosophy, you have something called general revelation and special revelation, right? Sometimes it's called uh, natural revelation or natural theology as opposed to uh, special revelation. But they basically mean the same. They're used r roughly similar there. General revelation and natural revelation or natural theology are usually used meaning roughly the same thing there. Now, if divine command theory is your ethical theory and you're saying it's what God commands that makes something right or wrong, well, this is the problem with that is, well, wait a minute. How did people seem to know right from wrong? And how do people seem to know right from wrong if they've never heard uh, of God's specific commands? Well, how do they... How can divine command theory account for people knowing right from wrong if they don't know God's commands? Now, some might say, well, that's, that's exactly right. They have to know God's commands to know right from wrong. But we just see this to be, we see this, this seems to be patently false, um, meaning that even if you take uh, the Christian text, you have God judging uh, surround, the surrounding nations of Israel prior to the giving of uh, law, right, or special revelation to those folks, right, even maybe even the Israelites at some point, you see him judging them even though they don't have, they didn't have quote unquote special re revelation of what God's commands were. But if God is judging them, that presupposes that they knew right from wrong, right? You don't judge someone for, some, for something that doesn't know right from wrong. In fact, this is exactly why children don't, you know, you know a, a one year old, or an infant, why they don't receive spankings or, or get in trouble or, or whatnot, because they just don't know any better, right? We, we, we wait for them to learn uh, to distinguish the difference, right, to, to ascertain right and wrong before they get in trouble, because it doesn't make much sense to get to judge people or for them to get in trouble until they actually know what they ought to be doing as opposed to what they shouldn't be doing, right, to what they ought not be doing. So if divine command theory is uh, your preferred ethical theory as an ethical theory on its own, not say the metaphysic meta-ethical concern there, but just by itself, if, if you're trying to offer divine command theory as a standalone theory, well then it really seems like it fails to account how people know right from wrong apart from receiving the divine commands. Um, apart from special revelation, right? Now, some might say, some Christian response might be that, well, the, 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 the commands are written on the heart of each individual, per se, something like Romans chapter 1. Well, that may be a valid response in light of Christian theology. But the problem again is that divine command theory is supposed to be that God is telling it, right? Um, but if the law is written on the hearts of individuals all across, you know, all time spans, well, then that may not necessarily be special revelation, right? That's something that you can know apart from, apparently, the, the, the actual divine command, the actual special revelation of God himself commanding something. Right, just like you don't have to have special revelation to uh, determine 
you know, mathematical truths or whatever. You can learn those. You can learn things about the, the stars and the moon and, and geology and all these sorts of things without divine intervention, so to speak, because that's a part of general revelation. Well, it seems like that's also the case with morality, that most people know right from wrong, apart from the special or the immediate divine commanding of right or wrong. And so that's what this objection is, is, is considering here. So let's read this. If taken as its own ethical system, it seems superfluous. People generally knew right from wrong prior to special revelation. And if true, it must be used in combo. So what is that last part in the parenthetical note there? What's that mean in parentheses? That if true, it must be used in combo. It means that <clears throat> if you want to still hold the divine command theory, it seems like now that really what you're going to do is hold to that as a Remember in the first slide that we mentioned that it's going to piggyback or dovetail on a different ethical theory. Meaning that it seems like, at least at this point, that you're going to have to hold some sort of ethical theory that can account for how most people know right from wrong, how most people live in accord with that, or, well, maybe they don't live in accord with that, but they, at least they do know right from wrong, and that's your ethical theory but to solve this grounding problem, maybe you're now going to allow divine command theory to dovetail, right, or piggyback on that ethical theory, meaning that the ethical theory helps get you how do you know right from wrong, but this divine command theory in conjunction with that grounds. It grounds the meta-ethical concerns about what makes it really right or really wrong. Well, all right, well, somebody says, well, no, no, it can't ground it because the youth of objection. Well, now you already have in your hip pocket there if you hold to this particular theory, something that answers that euthyphro type objection. Now, let's continue to move on. There's uh, other objections. Now, to call God good, this would be your, one of your third objection, that calling God good presuppo presupposes a prior notion of good, meaning if someone would say, well, God is good, so how do you know that? Personally, this is just me personally speaking, but I just don't think that this is actually a good objection because this seems to be an issue of confusing epistemology with ontology, right? Epistemology is that sub-discipline of philosophy, meaning how do we know, right? How do we, how do we know, the study of knowing, how do we know something to be the case? Um, ontology, or metaphysics, is a, a branch of philosophy, uh, probably the most basic, the most fundamental branch of philosophy of being itself, right? Existence itself. Now you see, though, these are actually two different categories because something can exist and you have to figure out how you know that, right? How you come to know what it is, what its nature is, if it has a nature, all these sorts of things. The what, epistemology is, you know, you may have to come to see how you know the whatness of something that it is, but that's different than it not being already what it is prior to your knowing it, right? You may come to know it a thousand different ways, and some it may be interesting how you come to know that, to figure out how you know that. That may be a very interesting pursuit, but it still doesn't mean that it not that it's not just it, it isn't just is what it is already prior to your ability or your methodology for knowing it. So how you come to know that God is good still doesn't seem to affect whether or not God is good already prior to how you come to know or even not know that, right? So you can look into that further with your readings, if you like, that we have here. Um, but that just seems like it confuses a matter of epistemology with ontology. Now, this is another objection. Wait, well, you know what? Before I forget this, I want to go back to this youth of Freud dilemma. I want to go back to this. Where was it? All right, here, here's this youth of Freud dilemma. I want to bring up another, another response that's often given to this real quickly. Notice that when a lot of folks toss out the youth of Freud dilemma, they say that, well, what makes something good or bad? Is it because God says it or is it because it already is? Well, if God says it, then it's arbitrary. If it already is, then, you know, uh, then there's some standard over and above that. But I want you to notice something. You could use the euthyphro dilemma in regard to any thing, any ethical theory that someone talks out. So let's say 
that tosses out. So let's say that someone you know, tries to get around divine command theory with the euthyphro dilemma. Well, you could just as easily toss out whatever their ethical theory is. Well, is, it, is that right or wrong just because your ethical theory says it, which makes it arbitrary? Or is it right or wrong uh, because it just already is right or wrong? And if it is, already is right or wrong, well, then there's some standard that it itself is being measured by. So the issue is not necessarily, you know, well, it's arbitrary or, or there's no standard. It's just which is the least arbitrary, right? which is the least, um, you're, every ethical theory is going to have to call what Mark Linville says is an ACM, a, 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 just a maxim that you begin with, an initial maximum, maxim, moral something that you just start with. And what you want to try to do is to see if your ethical theory is just completely arbitrary. Is that maxim, is that starting point, is that foundational nut there, <laughs> Is that arbitrary, right? And divine command theorists, it, 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 if the divine command theorist is using this as their grounding for the meta-ethical concern, then they're, what their argument is, is it's the least arbitrary starting maxim there. So just something to toss out. Because remember, any of them are going to have to start with some sort of uh, maxim, right? All right, so let's go back to this here. All right, so this objection would go something like, uh, or they would say that this poses the same difficulty as other deontological systems of moral dilemmas. Now, you remember when we talked about Kant, we talked about moral dilemmas, right? And we said that there's got to be something, um, whatever your ethical uh, system is, that can account for real moral dilemmas. Remember, we said that there's a couple different options. You could just deny that moral dilemmas exist, right? You could just say, well, there's not, re there's really no such thing as true moral dilemmas. Uh, and we, and if you've forgotten, go back through Kant's deontological system, our lecture on that, which discusses uh, some of those dilemmas, because I, frankly, I think it's absurd to say that there just are no moral dilemmas. Again, easily, classic example, uh, the, the Nazis knock on the door, you're hiding Jews in the basement, which really did happen. Remember, this is an, a hypothetical scenario. That really did happen. People really were hiding uh, innocent lives in their home, and others said, tell us the truth. Are you hiding innocent lives in the home? Well, which do you do? Save those innocent people, or do you just say, well, you know what? I can't lie. Yes, they're right here. Take them and kill them, right? Or maybe you wouldn't say take and kill. You would just say, well, they're right here, but you know that that's what's going to happen to them. So just to deny, to try to deny that there are moral dilemmas, I don't think is viable at all. Uh, remember, the other is that you can choose to do the lesser of two evils, which seems to result in contradiction because you have a moral obligation to do that which is immoral. But how does it make sense to say my, I, to be moral is to be immoral, right? I, that just seems to be incoherent, logically speaking. Or remember, you had something like uh, a hierarchicalism there, a graded absolutism. Now, or no, maybe we didn't even talk about that in the last lecture, but this is where that option comes in. There are divine command theorists that have offered something like this. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I think this is very interesting here. I think it seems like it's one of the best or one of the better solutions to these moral dilemmas. And it's called graded absolutism um, or sometimes called a hierarchicalism, meaning that there is a hierarchy to these commands or ethical principles, um, or there's a graded, like think of a, a triangle, right? Think of, if you can see this here, I'm trying to get it in conjunction with this camera. <laughs> All right, so think of a triangle that up here is something like your supreme virtue, or your, or, well, I should say virtue, your supreme moral principle here, and then each, as it goes down the line, you see how it's, it's broadening, broad, more broad at the, at the bottoms as it gets to the bottom, that all of your moral absolutes, they don't change, they don't change positions, but they are in a hierarchy, meaning that if two come together, right, if, 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 two, if this moral obligation is coming up towards you and this moral obligation is coming up towards you, well, so long as they're in that hierarchy, that one of these, if they come together, this one, this lesser 
absolute always merges under this one. It all this all it's always the case. Remember, it's not relativism because these never reverse positions. They never change. And it's always the case that this will always supersede this if those two moral obligations come together. Again, how's that not relativism? Because the position never changes. If this always comes against this, this will always supersede this. This always has to give way. So think of traffic merging. It always has to merge behind this. Always. It never changes. It's absolute. So say something like, and again, you'd have to go through our material here to see this more in depth, but however these would be ranked, right? Let's just say for sake of argument right now that uh, let's say that this uh, divine command theorist that holds to this, this graded absolutism as a solution to uh, solving moral dilemmas is that loving God or fidelity to God, let's say something like that, is always at the, the pinnacle, right? It's always at the top. Then let's just say again for sake of argument that it's something like taking, uh, protecting innocent life. Then it's, then it, uh, under that is, and is, if we're going down the triangle, something like truth telling, right? Now it's always, it's moral, it's a moral absolute. It's always objectively the right thing to do. Uh, the moral absolute is to tell the truth, right? And it's always the moral absolute, let's do it like this, to protect innocent life. Always. Now, if these two come into against one another, right? If these two come into uh, conf conflict, so to speak, these two obligations come together, you tell, uh, you tell the truth and admit that you have Jews in the basement or you protect innocent life. Well, which one always has to merge to the other? Which one always has to supersede? Which one always has to give way if, if these two come together? Well, how is that not relativism? Because this never changes, right? This is always, this will always be the case. That formula will always be the case. So in that sense, your moral obligation is to do what? The greater uh, good there. So you always have the moral obligation, if those two come together, to protect the innocent life, right? Again, that itself stirs up a lot of questions, but I think that's very interesting. If you want to go deeper into that, just you know, check into your check into our materials here. Um, so the three possible responses when we talk about the same difficulty that other deontological systems for moral dilemmas have, the three possible responses is no real dilemmas. We don't uh, it just seems out to lunch. Uh, choose the lesser of evil, which seems to be incoherent or contradictory, and you've got this graded absolutism or hierarchicalism as a possible option, which I think is very interesting there. So again, check your check our readings and our text there for more. Now, here's one of the big ones is Abraham and Isaac. Now, personally, I think this is, this is I'm gonna sound like I'm contradicting myself here, but it's almost one of the most interesting dilemmas to something like divine command, but it's also at the same time, it seems like to be one of the most overplayed uh, dilemmas, or not dilemmas, but uh, problems or objections to divine command. Now, I'm going to assume that everyone's familiar with this objection that God tells Abraham to offer his, his son Isaac as a sacrifice, right? Um, which seems to fly in the face of God being the one to say what is right or what is wrong, right? That seems to be a problem. And I think for honesty's sake, I think that we can say that it is a difficulty, right? If you're a theist, I can think I think that you can admit that that is difficult, right? I don't think that this has to be something that someone should say, well, you know, him and Hall and all this kind of stuff. I mean, and say, well, yeah, I think this is a real difficulty. Now, one of the ways, I believe, or there's actually a couple different options how you can answer this if you are a theist, if you're trying to hold to divine command theory as uh, true, right, and as uh, the correct uh, ethical theory here is one, I'm not sure that any theist would actually hold this as an option. I'm sure there's some, but I, I don't think that many what would be considered orthodox theists would consider this a real option, but one of the options is they could say that Abraham 
was mistaken, right? That God couldn't have possibly uh, commanded that he uh, sacrifice Isaac. I don't think that, again, that, that's a logically possible option, right? Meaning that, yeah, well, yeah, look, God, Abraham was just wrong. He, he thought he heard God say this. He just didn't, period. Um, again, I'm not sure that an Orthodox theist would hold that. Now, another option is that you could say something like Scripture is not inerrant, meaning Scripture does make mistakes. Well, yeah, you know, it says that, but that's not really what happened. Somebody made a mistake writing that down, and they were just straight up wrong because God wouldn't command that, right? Again, I don't think that most Orthodox theists would hold that. Now, I don't consider myself, again, because, you know, being an issue of philosophy, this is more of an, uh, an issue of uh, not only theology, but exegetical concerns and, 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 and things of that nature, um, which have offered all sorts of, of, of answers to this particular uh, instance. One, I would say, just to toss out for those that uh, are in consideration of this, again, you'd have to look into your text probably more, but one that I've heard uh, tossed out most often is that Abraham, but at the end of the day, it's this, that Abraham knew because God had already told Abraham that his offspring would be through the seed of Isaac, right, would be through Isaac, um, and that he saw Isaac, uh, Isaac was given to him through miraculous intervention, that he had all sorts of reason to actually trust that God would make uh, good on his promise that his offspring, that Abraham's descendants would come through Isaac. And so that if Isaac were actually dead, then that would make no sense. So Abraham actually already knows that there's going to be a solution to this and that God is not going to want him to literally uh, go through with this thing with his, with his son Isaac. Um, plus you have all these other contextual uh, considerations, not just linguistically, not just uh, scripturally contextual, but you have all of these historically uh, contextual or uh, uh, elements that are contextually important, meaning that all the surrounding nations of Israel are sacrificing their children all the time, which we do know to be historically true, and that for God to show that Israel was not going to be a nation that was going to uh, slaughter its children for the sake of these deities and gods is that God wanted to show Abraham in the most extreme form imaginable think field trip, right? You learn things well in the classroom, uh, but you seem to pick up on, on them more strongly if you learn them in actual practice in the lab, right, or in a, on a field trip. And so the way that God wanted to show Abraham in the strongest possible fashion that this would never be the case is to put him through what it would be like to do this, say no, to solidify, to burn into his uh, mind there, to burn into his soul, into his heart, however you want to word that, that this would never be uh, the case for the God of Israel. Again, you can look into that if you want, and that's really more out of my uh, discipline there. That's more, uh, again, exegetical, historical context, that sort of thing. But again, that's just usually one of the responses to something like the Abraham and Isaac objection. Now, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Conclusions and thoughts. Let's read through these first. Divine command theory is not dead as an ethical theory. In fact, this is... Again, probably one of the more popular theories, and it's even made something of a resurgence even within uh, the philosophical community. Because, again, it seems to be, and let's see if we already have this on here. Um, let's see. Okay. It seems to be uh, potent in trying to ground, when we look at our meta-ethical concerns, this grounding notion of what really does ground that makes something really right, really wrong? Well, it's this trans, it, it's grounded in this transcendent, unchanging, immutable nature of God Himself. Um, another conclusion or another takeaway we would say is that there do seem to be actions that are purely wrong in, in and of themselves, right? Because again, this was one of the, the problems with utilitarianism, any consequentialist type ethic, is that we wanted to say something like, but look, there just seems to be some things that just really are wrong, right? Regardless of what the consequences would be. Even if it's difficult, there just would be some things that are really right or wrong, regardless of consequences. 
And again, this would be some an ethical theory that would give you something like that, right? If something just completely contradicts the nature of God, it just can't possibly be right, right? This goes in again to that metaphysical aspect that we were just talking about. This seems to, it could possibly be the least arbitrary solution, right? Ontologically, metaphysically, again, for this grounding notion, right? Um, there must be something to account for moral dilemmas. Now, from what we've discussed, do you think that this offers something to account for moral dilemmas, right? Remember, you can skim back, go backwards, and look at this whole thing about graded absolutism, hierarchicalism, look at our material, uh, the text there to go deeper into that. Um, is this convincing or unconvincing as an ethical theory? You need to ask yourself this in regard to all the ethical theories that we've talked about. Does this produce more solutions than it does problems? Because remember, any ethical theory is going to have loose ends, so to speak. But what you're looking for is an ethical theory that has the least amount of problems. What seems the most plausible that you can handle, and then you can try to work out the peripheral issues uh, as you develop uh, your understanding of ethics and so on and so forth. Does it, what has the least amount of problems? Is this a theory that has more problems than the others, or the others have more problems than this one does? One of the questions, again, that we've, ha we've had to ask ourselves every time is, does this account for moral guilt? Does this, does guilt, when you're laying on your bed at night, right, and you feel guilty, like you, you know, you do something wrong, you have this genuine sense of guilt, is this an ethical theory that can account for that? Um, maybe you're guilty before God. This seems like this offers something like that. This makes sense of guilt. Um... We may argue, too, again, as a conclusion or a takeaway, is that it seems like that this might need to be at least combined with some sort of ethical theory, some sort of other ethical theory dovetail with another uh, to account for how people know right from wrong apart from, right? Uh, it's just special revelation. Um, again, because we looked at some of the difficulties of that. So anyway, here's a lot to think about. Um, uh, here's, you know, for more that we can look at, again, look at our text here that we have that you're reading for the course. Uh, these are other uh, additional uh, resources that you can that you can utilize here. Um, and just think about this theory, right? This is not dead as an ethical theory. It's here. Uh, there's objections to it, but there's a, a, a rich history of robust uh, engaging with those types of objections and so on and so forth. And so you can, again, just a lot to look at here. So until next time, that's divine command theory.